Hey guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bassin. Today we are talking jig fishing in the springtime. How to throw a jig during the pre-spawn to target bigger bass. We're talking about everything from a finesse jig to a flipping jig. We're talking about jig trailers, rod and reel selection. Whether you've got muddy water or clear water, we're gonna talk about how to get these jig fish to bite this time of year. A few days ago, we talked about where bass go during the springtime. We talked about targeting secondary points as you work your way back to spawning flats. We talked about what to do if the water was stable, what to do if you had incoming rain. If you guys missed that video, we'll put it down in the video description because we're building off of that. But today, again, we're talking jigs. We're going to break down the different varieties color selection, style, why we're using these things, and then talk about how to actually fish them. What I wanna do is I wanna start off on the finesse end. We're gonna start finesse, we're gonna end with power fishing. Let's cover it all. Just a couple of baits on the finesse end of the category. Uh, the three, well two styles that I throw and three jigs that I throw. One is gonna be a true finesse cut jig. The finesse cut, is a very well the name is in the title finesse approach it's more compact thinner skirt material very low profile and they just get bit if we're talking reservoirs and clear water we're talking about finesse baits it can be a true finesse jig or a finesse football but we're talking finesse this style jig will get way more bites than a bigger jig in almost every clear water circumstance. Now, why do you throw such a small jig? Well, again, get more bites, but on the flip side, it's still a jig. It still gets a lot bigger bite as a whole than worming or throwing a tube or uh, other varieties of finesse fishing. So if you can go out and confidently get a bunch of bites on a worm, on a Ned rig, on a Nico rig, on a shaky head, a drop shot, you can upsize into a finesse jig and typically get a bigger fish. Outside of throwing a swim bait, dedicating yourself to a swim bait, a jig is probably the best way to catch a new personal bass, to catch a giant bass during the spring. So in a reservoir situation, finesse jig. It can either be a true finesse cut jig or it can be a finesse football. Finesse football is going to be a football style head, but with a smaller hook than a standard football jig. Last one, this guy here, same deal. Football, smaller hook. The specific models and brands, I'm going to leave that down there for you in the video description. Uh, as well as color, but I'll jump into color a little bit here. Basically, there are only three jigs here. Finesse cut jig, a true finesse football, and then a Bass Patrol round rubber jig. Uh, I pair all of those up nine times out of ten with a curly tail grub. That's a Yamamoto five-inch curly tail grub. They make a four-inch and a five-inch. I, I lean to the five inch because I want that little bit more bulk if I can get away with it. The idea is that if you get in front of a smaller fish, if they'll still eat it, throw it because your odds are higher of a bigger fish taking a shot at the bigger bait. Now, if you're eliminating all your small bites and only going for a big fish, you might be hurting yourself. But start out with a five inch, throw that on your jig, and fish that. If it seems like you're not getting bit at all, drop down to a four inch, but don't go small too soon. See, there's that true finesse jig paired up with a five inch double tail grub. Great profile. Same thing with all my finesse jigs. Start with that five inch, back down from there. Uh, again, I said I'll give you all the specific colors in the video description, but I focus my time around the brown and purple, you know, super matte brown, one of my all-time favorite colors, brown and purple, brown on brown on brown, brown and green. Those key natural 
colors are your best bet in those clear water situations. Same with trailers, you know, green pumpkin, uh, cinnamon. Those are trailers that though it is a green pumpkin trailer, I pair it up with a super matte brown jig, which is brown and purple, but they go together because they're both natural. So even though they don't match, you can use it for a variety of things. I could match this up to a green pumpkin jig, perfect match. I can match it up to a brown jig, it's a great match. I can match it up to virtually anything and get away with it. So you don't need eight different colors of jig trailer. You want the trailer colors that will work for a variety of things. Next category, it's gonna be the all around jigs. You can do this in clearer water, but these are the jigs, and it's, it's actually one jig. I've got a variety of colors lying here, but it's one jig. That's a Dirty Jigs Pitchin' Jig, Arky style head. The Pitchin' Jig, if I could only have one jig, that would be the one that I carried in my boat year round. Um, in either a half or five eighths, three quarter even, but a half ounce is that true do everything. It's a little bit stouter hook, so downside of a stouter hook is I can't go as light on the line. So in crystal clear situations, you may get a few less bites there. Overall profile is a little bit larger, but we can change that. Don't be afraid to modify a jig. What I'll do, speaking of jig modifications, we're going to go down this little rabbit hole for a second. Two key modifications that you can do to any jig. One, check your weed guard. This one is super soft. I don't need to make any changes to that. Some jigs, manufacturer, manufacturer, it's not all the same. Some jigs, that weed guard's way too stiff. You can come in behind and trim a little bit off here. It won't make it less stiff, but you'll be right out at the end of the weed guard and it's easier to get hook penetration there. If you wanna actually shorten things up, I watch a lot of guys come in and cut some of the weed guard shorter. They kind of spread it out and cut some of them. You still end up with the base of the weed guard being really stiff, so I don't recommend that. What I would do instead is take pliers, come from the back side of the weed guard, the underside, and just pull some of them out. Remove a few, because what that does, see the weed guard's going into a hole in the lead. If you remove a few from the back, then there's a void there in the lead. There's an actual hole behind the rest and it's easier for them to lay down and collapse. So it'll actually make the entire thing softer. If you just trim them short, like a lot of people do, just take part of the skirt and chop it, well that little part that still remains becomes incredibly rigid and hard to move and will actually hurt your hookup ratio. Now the skirt, I mentioned this jig, bulkier than this jig. What you can do is just trim that skirt up. Just make it shorter. Makes all the difference in the world. I mean, a finesse cut jig is just a trimmed jig. You separate the front skirt from the back and you trim just the front. That's how that happens. Now there also, there's less skirt material in a finesse jig. That would be a pain to replicate. You could do it, you could pull strands out of here. But the easiest thing is just shorten up that skirt. Just create a smaller profile and you'll find that you get more bites. But if your fish are not being finessey, they're aggressive, they wanna eat, don't even bother. Get a pitching jig, the weed guard's already right, length is good, put a trailer on it and just fish it, you're gonna catch a ton of fish. Now, color selection. Again, that brown purple, one of my favorites. We've got a color called Go To. That's the one I've been holding this whole time. Go To is an amazing color. It's very basic. It's basically brown and green pumpkin. Works exceptionally well. Most of you guys know that because over the last year or two, it's become incredibly hard to get. Well, this one right here, I thought I'd throw this in here for you guys because I know it gets frustrating when you want something and can't get it. This is called Green Pumpkin Craw. The colors are almost the same, very, very, very similar. Green pumpkin cross just a little bit lighter and has a brown head instead of a primarily green head. That's it. So if you're trying to get go-to this spring and you can't get it, green pumpkin craw is an awesome option as well. But again, we're talking brown and purple, 
either one of these is basically green pumpkin and brown. And then if you get into the murky water, that's a different ball game. Then we're talking about some version of black and blue. But we'll circle back on the black and blue. Trailer selection, you can of course throw a double tail grub. I also add in, and this is my primary trailer, is a beaver, just a standard beaver. Uh, if I could only have one color, it would probably be green pumpkin red. That's changed over the years. And some of you guys know I'm a jig fishing fanatic. Some of you are just finding that out now. Uh, over the years, I've been worse about a jig than I ever was about a swim bait. I mean, I love jig fishing and I'm really precise about it uh, because I think it matters. The details are the difference between just catching fish and catching monster fish. But that doesn't mean you have to spend a ton of money or own 50 different styles of jig. It just means that you need to be careful with your selection. So if I've got any variety of pitch and jig and I take a green pumpkin red trailer, it's gonna match, it's gonna work. You don't need to own 100 trailers. That said, there's a time and a place for some of those oddballs, right? There's a time and a place for a black and blue or a June bug. But if you wanna be careful, focus on those trailers that give you the best bang for the buck. So green pumpkin red is an amazing choice. This one is one that I've thrown, I don't know, at least a decade. It's called Delicious. I never see anyone talk about this color. It's basically brown. I guess you call that brown. Yeah, I'm gonna call it just straight brown paired up with a June bug red. So brown paired with purple with green and red flake in it. Can you guys make that out? The coolest thing about this jig is that if you, or this color, is if I pair it up to a natural color jig, you don't get the bright, bold colors out of it. What shows up is the natural tones, the browns pull out. But I take that same trailer and I throw it on say a black blue, a bold color, and it pulls out all the June bug. But it works with both. You can fish it natural, you can fish it with a bright, bold, aggressive color, you can do it all. So again, as you're looking for trailers, whether this speaks to you or not, it's one of my favorite colors that I always stock because again, I can pick it up. I can match it to a peanut butter and jelly jig. It's brown and purple. I can match it to a green pumpkin jig. I can match it to a black and blue jig. Uh, it's one of my favorites, but regardless of whether or not that, that clicks for you, when you look at your jig trailer colors at the shop, pick the ones that you can do the most with. Don't go get some oddball color that is only gonna work for one situation unless that's a situation that you do a lot and you need to stock that color. So I keep, again, for a pitch and jig, I keep my trailer selection pretty simple. It's almost always a beaver, occasionally a double tail grub or something different, but that's my just bread and butter. Going to the other end, flipping. The flipping approach, we talked about this again in that video the other day, is when you start getting a lot of heavy influx of water, if you're flooding, the bass move up, they get right on the bank, they get right in the cover, they get in that fast water. That is when you need to start flipping. The murkier the water, the tighter the bass get to the cover. If that water is just straight chocolate milk, they'll be up touching that cover. So get a good flipping jig for that situation. This is a no-jack flipping jig, giant hook in there. I don't know if the camera does that any justice, but for comparison's sake, compare that to a finesse football. And it's a monster jig. I've literally never bent one of these out, ever. Not a single jig, not a single time have I ever bent one, whether I'm fishing it on a leader or straight braid or anything else, they just hold up. Color selection, Again, I'm only doing this around those murkier conditions. It's almost always gonna be black and blue. That said, black and blue has some options. So this is, a, this is a true black and blue jig. And you can see how bold that is. And it, black and blue jig is hands down number one bestseller across every company across the entire country. A black and blue jig is the deal. But 
black and blue can be pretty darn bold. And there's a time and a place when you want something else. So consider, as an alternative, this guy. That's a hematoma colored jig. Hematoma is originally a Reaction Innovations color. This one is a perfect match to it. Still a black and blue jig. The blue comes out in the light. But look how less bold that color is. So depending on how muddy my water is, I'm gonna make one selection or the other. It doesn't always have to be really bright and really bold, but there's a time and a place for it. And then trailer selection, of course, is, is gonna match. The beaver is a great option, but when the water gets super muddy, I'll throw the kinky beaver or a man bear pig. These are both a kinky beaver. This color is called low blow. You can see super bright, super bold, pairs up perfectly with that traditional black and blue. This one, still black and blue, still works awesome in muddy water. That color is called hematoma. Pairs up perfectly to that less obnoxious, less aggressive black and blue. Will work in that super muddy water, but as that water is clearing, it will continue to work. I can take that all the way until I'm comfortable switching over and going to a natural color. Now, as far as how to actually fish these baits, the more aggressive, heavy flipping, that sort of speaks for itself. I'm typically throwing that straight braid. In fact, that one's still tied on from being out fishing just a couple days ago. That is a hematoma jig, hematoma trailer, three quarter ounce flipping jig. I'm gonna put it on a heavy flipping stick. You guys have seen me talk about this rod before and I'm gonna talk about it really quickly. X Pride 711 Extra Heavy. As flipping sticks go, for years I thought that I hated flipping. Turned out that I didn't hate flipping, I hated my flipping sticks. They made it really uncomfortable to do. When I finally got the right rod, I found out that I had a passion for flipping that I never knew was there. So flipping that jig and flipping a heavy Texas rig or punching, it all takes the same rod. So I do that on a 7-Eleven extra heavy. That X-Pride for once is in stock. I checked this morning. So as of shooting this video, they have that rod in stock. You can get it. Uh, they're like 279 ish Don't quote me on that. But I've fished a lot of flipping sticks and that rod in the mid 200s, it may be out of the price range for some people. It's definitely not for other people. But I've fished three and four and five and $600 flipping sticks that I didn't like anywhere near as much as that rod right there in the middle of the price point. Uh, so anyway, flipping, I love that rod for it. Again, it's a super big, super heavy action rod because you're going to be going in the cover after these fish, deep in the cover. Don't be afraid to get dirt shallow. Put your boat up in a foot or two or three feet of water, flip up into the brush, into the grass, at the base of the laydowns. And the way you do it is just flip in there, let that thing hit bottom, and then just shake it. If you don't get anything, shake again, pull out, go to the next piece of cover. The key to that super muddy water jig fishing is to not move quickly. The bass's strike zone is smaller. So I'm gonna flip to the base of this stick, and then I'm gonna pull out, and I'm gonna flip to the base on the other side. Pull out, flip to the base over here. I might only be moving that jig six inches to a foot between flips, because the bass aren't willing to move as far as normal to get that jig. Now as the water gets warmer, they'll move a little farther, but when we're flooding this time of year, Early March flood conditions, that's typically cold water. So you gotta get right in that cover. And don't be afraid to get shallow. That's where those fish will be. They'll be following that rising water up. Once it stabilizes, then it'll change. Those fish will back back out a little bit. But as long as that water's muddy, they're still gonna be tight to cover. Once it starts to clear, they'll start branching out. Now the pitching jig, we're working backwards here. The pitching jig, that's that all around do everything jig. You can flip with it. By all means, you can flip with it, but it's not a dedicated flipping jig. It's not as good as, say, a no-jack jig, but it will do it. You can also throw it in and around grass. 
Not as good as a grass jig, but it will absolutely do it. It's fantastic around rock. And it's great on mud. You can throw it just like you would a finesse jig out on secondary points, fishing from shallow to deep or turn around, fishing deep up. The beauty of a pitching jig is that head shape. It gets caught up on everything. If there's rock, it gets hung up a lot. But because of the head shape, it never wedges in. It's not like a V-shaped head that will wedge in and get stuck. This will just come in and bump up and not want to move. So you pop that rod a couple of times, snap on that line, and it'll pop up over. The nice thing about getting stuck is that if you've got a fish that's watching it, when that thing pops free, that's where a lot of your bites come from. So there's a huge perk in a jig that will hang up as it's coming along, but doesn't actually get snagged and get broken off. So again, you can do everything with that. I've been playing with a new rod for my kind of do everything. I've been playing with the Mega Bass Brailist. Uh, I've been looking for another jig rod. Like I said a few minutes ago, pretty fanatical about my jig fishing. I like a longer rod for that all around jig fishing. Uh, somewhere in that 7.5, seven, 7.6, seven, 7.7 seven, seven, because I can move a lot I can hit them hard. I can move a lot of line when I swing on those fish. Uh, but I still want a forgiving tip in that rod. And that is such a hard combination to find. So over the years, I found two or three or four really good rods for it. But I've always been looking for more sensitivity. So lately, I've been playing with the Brailleist. It's an Orochi. Uh, seven foot five, all around great jig rod that I'm going to continue to play with, but so far very, very happy with that rod. It's got that much softer tip, but then you still get a lot of backbone. It can throw an all around jig and then it could throw all the way down to the larger of the footballs as well. So I've been playing with that. Then last but not least, getting back to the true finesse approach. Where are you doing that? Well, as these fish are making that spring transition, they're going to be hopping along those secondary points. That is a prime scenario for a finesse jig. Fire it up, fish it down, figure out what depth those fish are sitting at, develop that pattern, and then replicate it. You find out they're out on the ends of rock points that roll off in 15 feet. Pull up to every rock point, 15 feet. Hop that jig along. Two ways to fish that jig. One is just to pull it, let it sit. Pull it, let it sit. That's it. The other way is to shake it and let it sit and then pop it up. And that's how you make your movements. So one is just literally dragging. The other is bouncing and then it pumps up. I use a double rod hop to move it. Reel up my slack, shake it, double rod hop, reel up my slack. If you've ever watched a crawdad underwater, a lot of times they'll jump up off the bottom and then they kick to move. It's a two-part motion. So I always do that double hop. It's just worked really well for me over the years. So you can do, you can cover all that offshore, long tapering point type water with that finesse jig. You can also, of course, just fire it up along the bank. And then if you're on a lake that has a lot of docks or hard cover, of course, you can pitch it along all that stuff too. You can do anything with any of these jigs. Realize that. You could just buy one jig and do everything. Don't get completely caught up, but understand that just like anything, they're built for some very specific categories and one is far better than another. Can you drag a flipping jig out in deep water over structure? Of course you can. Are you gonna enjoy that as much as using a little jig that's designed for it? No, because you're only gonna get a quarter as many bites and you're gonna get hung up more, but you can do it. Same thing with a finesse jig. I could take it and go pitch it in heavy cover, but it's gonna hang up more, it's gonna get stuck, Right out the gate, it has a softer weed guard, so it's gonna get snagged more. I don't have as strong of a hook to get those fish out. So there's a right tool for each job. That's what I wanna stress for you. And then that finesse jig, you guys know, because we talked about it all winter, that I like a little bit shorter rod for that. I use a seven foot one, medium heavy. Uh, the reason why is because that lighter hook is not as hard to penetrate those fish. So I go to lighter line, typically throwing braid to 12 pound. Uh, that 12 pound line is plenty to bury a finesse hook, plenty. You could even drop down farther than that. 
Uh, but I've found in my fisheries that even if they've got 15 to 20 feet of visibility, if they're on a jig bite, I can get bit on 12 pound. It's very rare that I have to drop down from there. Uh, but if you want to move up, of course you can. If you start losing water clarity, go to heavier line because you have less risk when you hook a big fish. Last tip, I'm going to give you one more random tip. This is something I talked about in several videos over the years, but probably haven't talked about in the last four or five years. As you're getting murkier water, because again, a lot of us have inflow right now, a lot of rain coming down. If that water isn't so muddy that you want to throw black and blue, but it's got some significant color to it, quick tip, and I didn't even bring one in here to show you, get a chartreuse Yamamoto Senko, like five inch Senko. Chartreuse or chartreuse pepper, bright, bold, yellow, green. I mean, it's bright. Cut off about a half an inch of that Senko, just a little section of Senko. Put that on your jig, thread it on. Put that on, then shorten your trailer up. Make your trailer shorter than normal, and then put your normal trailer on. It just leaves a little chartreuse core in the center of that jig. I can't tell you how many big fish I've caught throwing a brown and purple or a brown and orange jig with a matching trailer. Like a super matte brown jig, green pumpkin trailer with a little half inch of bright, bold chartreuse in there when that water clarity was like a foot to three feet of visibility. Where it's clear enough that they're finding a natural jig, but there's still some water color there. I'll tell you what, there is something special about that. It's different. They've never seen it before. Get out there and try it. You'll find in some situations you get way more bites with that little bit of chartreuse in there. That's just a little bonus because you made it to the end of a very long video. I appreciate you guys. If you enjoyed the video, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. If you have questions or comments, feel free to leave that for us. Just remember guys, it's springtime. It's headed into the pre-spawn. One of the best times of year to catch a great big bass. Don't be afraid to get out there and do it. And a jig is a great way to do it. We appreciate you. We'll talk to you soon.